For the final part of chapter six, we're gonna talk about enzymes. Uh, we talked a little bit about what they do in the kind of reaction energy chapter uh, section, but here we're gonna talk more about kind of their broader role. Um, obviously, this is a very surface level look at this. Uh, there are super, super specialized enzymes. We're gonna mainly look at enzymes in the context of metabolism, uh, the metabolic pathways that we're gonna talk about in this course, but there are enzymes that do all kinds of chemical reactions. Um, so we'll, we'll look a little bit about pathways and then what they do as catalysts, kind of how they do it, surface level, and then um, talk about a little bit about enzyme regulation because enzymes can control the rate of chemical reactions. You can actually also control that with controlling like how the enzymes are working or how much of the enzymes are around and things like that. So there gets to be very fine control in these things. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the gene regulation chapter as well. So as we said, enzymes are biological catalysts that reduce the activation energy. Um, they are mainly proteins. There are a few kinds of RNA, particularly rRNA, that are catalytic as well, but mainly proteins. And what they do is they create a conformational change. So this conformational change, that means they change the shape of the molecules going in. And that makes the reaction easier. It reduces the activation energy. Um, so we need some terminology here to, to understand how we're gonna talk about enzymes. We have the enzyme itself, which has a region that we call the active site. The active site is the region of the enzyme that fits and binds the things called the substrates. What are the substrates? That's the chemical reactants that go into the reaction. Um, so the thing that the enzyme binds to basically. So the active site is determined by the 3D shape of the enzyme protein. And then the substrate will fit in there. Uh, once the substrate's in there, uh, it goes through that conformational change that allows the reaction to occur at a faster rate because we're lowering activation energy. Now you'll see in this cartoon diagram, here we have one substrate going into the active site. Uh, we have uh, kind of weak binding here and conformational change and then the one substrate is broken up into two products here but the reverse could also be true there's probably an enzyme that takes these two things they would be the substrates and they come in and it helps catalyze the reaction of putting those two things together so enzymes can help break things apart and enzymes can also help put things together the critical part here is that the enzyme is not used up in this process, okay? It's just uh, playing a role, but it, it's not actually like reacting per se. Also, if this binding site, the active site, is determined by 3D shape, that means that things that affect proteins 3D shape, like high temperatures or changes in pH or high amounts of salt or things like this, they can all cause enzymes not to function properly. That's called denaturation because the enzyme loses its shape. So if, if you go into biochemistry of some sort, you'll learn more about enzymes than uh, we're gonna go into. But one of the things that happens is when the substrate binds in the active site, the enzyme kind of fits around it. We call this induced fit. And there's some uh, mild shifting in the enzyme shape that reinforces like a stronger binding and then creates that conformational change allowing the substrate to go through its transition state. That lowers the activation energy. We call this an enzyme substrate complex, okay? Um, I wanna introduce this terminology because you'll probably see that um, later as you continue on in biology. But again, the enzyme is not actually used up in this process, okay? Um, it is just uh, there, something comes in, it helps catalyze the reaction, and then those things leave. And the enzyme can continue doing that. Here, I wanna show you an example of how biology is probably more diverse in terms of what people do than you might think. So, <clears throat> this isn't my thing, but some people, they spend their whole careers studying one enzyme, okay, one protein. And they might 
map out how that protein is shaped using special microscopy techniques and things like that, x-ray diffraction, things like that. And then they could make 3D models of it. And then they could try to figure out, okay, where does the substrate actually bind in this enzyme? And how does it do its catalysis? And you can see here in this model, right, uh, this, this molecule fits into this active site of the enzyme here. And this one uh, fits in there and is probably breaking it apart. This one, two things come in and they get stuck together by the enzyme. So people have 3D modeled this using physics information and chemistry information. Uh, and who knows what this does, right? This could be a real, real important enzyme. This could be a very niche enzyme. But knowing this, what could we do with that? Well, if this is a really important enzyme, like it catalyzes a reaction that breaks down, I don't know, like cellulose, you could maybe engineer a better enzyme that does that, and then you could create bioreactors that break down cellulose, byproducts from like, uh, you know, harvesting corn, right? We have a lot of cellulose left over in the stock. Usually we feed that to cows, but maybe we could put it into a bioreactor and make biofuel out of that. And we could engineer better enzymes if we know how they do their catalysis. We could modify their structure and make them even more efficient. So there's a whole bioengineering side behind this too. So there are lots of possibilities here. If you like 3D modeling, if you like uh, computation and mathematics, there's all kinds of opportunities in biology for you. And a lot of biologists aren't really good at this stuff. So if you're good at math, you're good at computers, uh, you have an advantage over many biologists. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about enzyme control. So as I talked about earlier, right, you're like a marshmallow and you got all those nutrients in you uh, when you eat the marshmallow, right? Um, and that's a lot of energy, right? Remember we said the marshmallow could explode and you could explode, right? You have all these nutrients in you. You could burst into flames. There's so much going on. Well, I said that enzymes help control the rates of reactions. And one of the ways they do that is through changes in their own shape. Okay, we're gonna talk briefly about this, um, but we're gonna talk about how we can regulate the activity of enzymes. Um, there are some things that will enhance enzymes activity, and there are some things that will inhibit it. So there are basically switches that can speed up an enzyme or slow down an enzyme. We're gonna talk first about inhibitors, things that slow them down. And they break into two broad classes. We have competitive inhibitors. These are things that can actually bind in the active site of the enzyme, and they really block the function of the enzyme. So this enzyme normally fits this green substrate, but a competitive inhibitor can come in and bind in there and block that, okay? So uh, this might come in, that might be something that you don't want to happen, right? But in other uh, cases, competitive inhibition is used to just slow down the rates of certain reactions. Obviously, the more competitive inhibitor, the slower this reaction is going to occur. As it becomes less and less, this will be able to come in and bind. And there's many, many enzymes out there, right? It's not just one molecule there. There's millions of them in there. Okay, so I think that one's pretty clear, right? If you got something blocking the active site, you can't do the reaction. Let's look at the other class though. This one's a little more tricky. These are called non-competitive inhibitors and they bind to a different region of the protein. We call this an allosteric site. It's not the active site, but what it does is when the inhibitor binds to it, it changes the overall shape of the protein and it changes the shape of the active site. So we can see it's gone from this kind of crescent shaped area to this kind of dent here and the substrate doesn't fit. Now this might seem weird, right? You're shutting off your enzyme, but imagine this, right? You already have enough energy, you wanna store some energy as uh, glycogen. So you take glucose and instead of breaking it down, you stick it together to build glycogen as a storage molecule, right? So shutting off this enzyme, which would normally break this down, could be a really useful thing. And then when you need to turn it back on, you just reduce the amount of the non-competitive inhibitor and uh, the enzyme starts working again. Allosteric regulation can happen in two ways. Um, and we'll talk more about this, but I want you to think of uh, 
inhibition, which is negative regulation, versus activation, which is positive regulation. So we could have an allosteric inhibitor, which binds to the enzyme and alters the active site so the enzyme can't work. But we could also have the reverse of this. We could have an enzyme that is normally folded with the active site closed, basically, and our allosteric activator comes in and actually opens up the active site. So it could go both ways. And you can see that through combinations of this, you can really like fine tune the activity of enzymes here. If you're really interested in the logic and um, computers and circuits and um, programming and things like this, there's a whole region of biology um, called gene regulation, and enzyme regulation, where feedback loops can happen on this. Um, one thing can affect another thing, which affects another thing, and there's big regulation loops. So there's lots of possibilities in here um, for regulation to occur. So here's some examples um, of some drug inhibitors. Like I mentioned, um, we have cyanide. All right, so here's part of the electron transport chain. We're gonna learn all about this in the coming chapters for metabolism. Uh, but this uh, set of enzymes um, allows hydrogens to be pumped across the membrane and those go through ATP synthase and create ATP. Well, there is this molecule called cyanide. You may have heard of it. It's often used as a poison in murder mystery shows, right? Uh, but cyanide is a non-competitive inhibitor. It binds to one of the enzymes in this process and it shuts off the active site. It alters the shape. Okay, uh, that means that oxygen cannot be released from this reaction and the electron transport chain shuts down. You stop making ATP. If you stop making ATP, your chemical reactions stop and quickly you will die from that. So cyanide, it acts through the uh, altering of the shape of an enzyme. There's another class of drug you may have heard of called statin drugs. They're used to help uh, reduce uh, basically cholesterol uh, in the blood. Um, so there are a series of enzymes uh, that help convert things. One of them is HMG-CoA reductase, fun name. It takes HMG-CoA and probably reduces it here to melvalonic acid, whatever that is. But this is a key role in the production of cholesterol in the body. Statin drugs come in and compete for the active site of HMG-CoA reductase, reducing the amount of cholesterol that gets made in your body. So if your doctor determines that you're eating enough cholesterol, your body does not need to make any more cholesterol, they might prescribe you a statin drug, which would compete for this enzyme's active site, lowering cholesterol production overall. So this way of reducing or inhibiting enzymes is key to many of our medicines uh, there. So we saw an example that was bad, cyanide, and we see an example that is better uh, here, statin drugs that can help lower uh, cholesterol. Now, enzymes don't do this all on their own. There are important things that often help enzymes function. We're gonna talk about two classes broadly uh, here. Um, we have a group called cofactors and a group called coenzymes that help the enzyme itself do its job. So these are non-protein helper molecules that are required for enzyme activity. Let's talk about cofactors first. Cofactors are inorganic helper molecules like iron or magnesium or zinc, right? Um, hemoglobin in the blood uses iron in it. Uh, if you go on in science and do PCR, which you will do in this class, but if you learn more about it, magnesium is an important cofactor for the enzyme DNA polymerase, which builds copies of DNA. So understanding magnesium is critical in understanding how that enzyme functions. Coenzymes, on the other hand, are organic helper molecules, and we broadly call these vitamins. So you might have heard of things like vitamin A, folic acid, uh, vitamin B2, vitamin D2, uh, right? These are all organic molecules that help enzymes do things. Now, I'm not going to get into the nutrition side of this, but I'm... Um, Historically, we have noticed that people who have deficiencies 
in these vitamins tend to have some sort of effect on their body. That's generally because the enzymes that require these coenzymes, these vitamins, they can't do their job. Now, there is some like, if not enough of it is bad, maybe lots of it is good. And so there was a whole movement, particularly promoted by this chemist Linus Pauling, that taking huge amounts of vitamin C uh, is good for you. Um, whether that's been borne out by the evidence is debatable, but uh, there's there's whole groups of people that do that, right? So um, I, I would say there's probably a happy medium, right? Um, just because not having any of it uh, means it's bad doesn't mean taking lots of it is necessarily good. So um, there's, there's still active research into how much of these things do we need uh, in our diet. Okay, I want to finish with a little more complicated example here. So we've been talking about enzymes in like a, a bubble here, right? We just have one enzyme that catalyzes this one reaction. But that's not how metabolism works. Metabolism is often a pathway. So in this hypothetical pathway here, I have the substrate, the green triangle. Substrate green triangle gets converted into intermediate substrate A, this purple rectangle. And that intermediate substrate A gets converted into intermediate substrate B, this blue wavy thing. And that gets converted into the end product. So the goal of this series of reactions is to take the substrate and turn it into the end product. To do that, we have to do a series of chemical reactions that are each catalyzed by an enzyme. This is what we would call an enzyme pathway. Now, we can have complicated regulation of this process. So we look at uh, this first enzyme here, okay? Enzyme one takes the green triangle and turns it into intermediate substrate A which then enzyme two takes that and turns it into intermediate B, and then enzyme three turns that into the end product. But what if we have plenty of this end product? We don't need to do this series of reactions, right? That would be wasteful. We already have plenty of end product. So how could we shut down the production of this? Well, here's where we get into kind of circuits and logic, because what we're gonna see is a feedback loop here. We're going to see something called feedback inhibition. This is using a reaction's product um, to regulate its own production. So the end product, the yellow square, can actually bind to an allosteric site on enzyme one and change its shape. So if you have lots of the end product, it's gonna come over and bind to enzyme one, shutting down all the enzyme one there, okay? We don't need to make any more of this, so that's fine. But as the levels of our uh, end product, our square, drop, it's gonna start to fall off the active site and more and more of enzyme one will be open for the substrate to come in and get converted and we'll start making more product. As the product builds up, the reaction will slow down, right? And it can regulate itself through this feedback inhibition. So basically, the more end product you have, the more you slow down the making of end product. And the less you have, the more you speed it up. Okay, let's look at a real example of this now. Um, okay, uh, this is for the production of isoleucine. And I believe this is a bacterial pathway. I don't think we can make isoleucine, um, but there are bacteria that can make it. So isoleucine is an amino acid. And to build it, you have to go through a series of reactions. Sorry, you don't do this. Bacteria would do this. Uh, the bacteria go through a series of reactions. You don't have these enzymes, so you can't make it. So you have to eat isoleucine to get it. It's one of those essential amino acids. So we start with the initial substrate. That is another amino acid called threonine. Threonine goes into the active site of uh, this enzyme one which is threonine deaminase. Don't memorize that, I don't have it memorized, but it probably deaminates threonine, okay? It does a reaction, converts it into intermediate A. There's another enzyme, converts it into intermediate B. Another enzyme, intermediate C. Another enzyme, D, another enzyme. Finally, we get to our end product, which is isoleucine. So we have five enzymes here converting these things until we finally get to isoleucine. So isoleucine can be used by the cell but if the level of isoleucine builds up, 
it can bind to the uh, allosteric site of enzyme 1, threonine deaminase. So you'll notice that arrows here mean things are moving forward, and this bar line here means that there's some sort of inhibition or stopping of the process. So if isoleucine starts to build up like we've made more than the cell needs to use, it will start to bind to uh, the threonine deaminase and stop it from doing its reaction, right? There's uh, inhibition here, feedback inhibition. But as the levels of isoleucine start to drop, the active site is going to start to open up and we can, uh, the bacteria can start to make more from using threonine as a substrate. Okay, this is all about saving energy because many of these reactions in here use a considerable amount of energy. So if you don't need isoleucine, say the bacteria just ate a meal that's rich in isoleucine, you have lots of it, why waste energy making it, right? So this is how cells start to regulate their activity. This is a very simple example of it. I know it doesn't look simple, but it is in the broad scheme of things. All right, cool. I hope I've shown you that enzymes can be cool. Um, and uh, what's even crazier is in many enzymatic pathways, there's regulation steps on every single one of the enzymes. So there's lots of factors going in. All right, we're going to finish up with a review question here. So the thing that enters an enzyme's active site is known as what? Go ahead and pause the video. Think about that. Right, the thing that goes into the enzyme's active site is the substrate, and that is what the reaction is occurring on. Okay. So, enzymes, they're biological catalysts, primarily they're proteins, and they're reducing the activation energy of the reaction to speed up the reaction. They're not actually playing a part um, in terms of being used in the reaction, they're just lowering the activation energy to speed up the process. So substrates enter the active site and then they go through kind of a shape change, that conformational change to make the chemical reaction easier. The enzyme is not used up in the process. We talked about inhibition. Competitive inhibitors compete for space in the active site. Non-competitive inhibitors bind to an allosteric site outside of the active site and change the shape. There uh, are examples of allosteric regulators that can be activators. They can increase the level of uh, enzyme activity. And there are uh, inactivators um, or uh, inhibitors, they might be called. Many enzymes require helper molecules. If that helper molecule is inorganic, we call it a cofactor. Usually those are ions of some sort, iron, magnesium, zinc, things like that. Coenzymes, on the other hand, are organic helper compounds. We call those vitamins. And then I showed you an example of feedback inhibition. This is kind of a regulatory circuit where the buildup of the end product inhibits the production of that, uh, that end product. So, um, if you have a lot of end product, it inhibits its own production. I definitely want you to know about this feedback inhibition example for an exam, say. All right, that is it for chapter six.